to the middle of your Bible. Brother Rudy's already read to us Psalm 95. But that's where the message is going to be from this, this morning. So if you open it up, if you open your Bible to just about the very middle, that should be about where Psalm 95 is. And I hope you can find it this morning. It's a wonderful uh, psalm. We're going to be looking at the, the subject today is approaching God with worship. Approaching God with worship. And you know what? It's amazing that you can approach God anytime. Every moment, every hour, you can find Him. And there's joy. the Bible says, In His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. So if you need joy, just find God. Find His presence so you can approach Him. Last night, uh, this was just uh, not, not, nothing really to do with the message this morning, but last <laughs> night uh, uh, I was exhausted, but I couldn't sleep. And uh, about two in the morning, Natalie was too, but we got back, we had three airplanes and three trains to get back to Peterborough, and uh, you know, we, we got to bed on Friday night, we slept really well Friday night, but then last night, uh, the, the Tennessee time started coming back to us, and Natalie's stomach at two in the morning thought it was dinner time, and she said, I need a, I need a cheeseburger, <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I can't get you a cheeseburger right now, and then, but then a couple hours later, I couldn't, I was still awake, and I couldn't sleep. And this hasn't happened to me in years since I was since I was a kid, really. But all of a sudden, I, I started feeling really strange. My mind started racing. Every sound in the room started being accentuated in my mind, and and I recognized that's the same. I wasn't really particularly anxious about anything, but I I recognized that that was the same as when I had a few anxiety attacks when I was younger. And so I was I thought, what am I what am I going to do? I have to get to sleep. I have to preach in the morning. And, uh, you know, but uh, that verse from Philippians all of a sudden came to my mind. And I started uh, quoting it to myself, be anxious for nothing, or be careful for nothing. It says, actually, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your mind, uh, hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so I just started saying that verse to myself, and I kept saying it until I fell asleep. And so you know God's there for us, and he, he can help you anytime you can find His presence, you can approach Him. Well, this morning, I want to talk about how we can approach God, uh, how we can approach God. It's amazing that we can pray. We just sang uh, a song I don't, haven't really heard before. Ulrika, that was a great choice, the Garden of Prayer. But we can go into that garden, we can approach God. We can come boldly before the throne of grace. We can pray. In the Old Testament, the priests, only one priest, the high priest, could go in once a year to the presence of God in the ark, in the in the tabernacle. And if he was, if there was nothing, if there's anything in his life that wasn't right, he would die on the spot, and he'd have to go make the sacrifice, of course, for himself and for the people. But Jesus, he he was the ultimate sacrifice, and the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. We can approach God boldly to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We can pray. We can approach God. But how can we pray? How should we pray? How should we approach God? That's a pretty big big deal if you think about it. Approaching God. You get to talk to God. You, little you. You know, if you, if you approached God physically in, the, in your human sinful body, you would die instantly. That's why Moses couldn't see God uh, literally face to face. You know, he couldn't see God in all of his glory. Because God told him you would die. But one day we will. We'll, we'll be, we're, we're already completely forgiven, but one day we'll, we'll be completely made whole. We'll have our glorified bodies. We'll be able to see God face to face. But until then, how can we approach God? Well, the first way that we should approach God is with worship. With worship. And we'll talk about other things in future days, Lord willing, about how we should approach God with confession and that uh, we should approach God uh, to try to find His will. But uh, this morning I want to talk about that first one, approach God with worship. And that's what Jesus said, didn't he? When he said, you, you pray, you're supposed to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, didn't he? And that's the attitude of worship. And so that's what we find here in Psalm 95. Brother Rudy read almost all of the chapter, but look at verse 6 again with me. Look at verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before God, our Maker. O come, let us worship. It says in verse 6. Now, the word come there uh, literally means approach. 
Oh, approach. Approach God. Let us worship. But when we approach God, we have to bow down. We have to worship. Now, uh, what is worship? Worship, uh, when I use the word worship, automatically people get some certain ideas in their mind. They might think I'm talking about a certain type of music. You know, and, and uh, you might get nervous. I know the preacher's going to preach about music, you know. But, uh, uh, of course, uh, what you listen to, the type of music you listen to, really has nothing to do with your salvation. But, uh, but when we worship God, it does involve singing and music. And so, uh, so it's, I hope you didn't get too nervous, but we might touch on music a little bit in the message this morning. But, but we won't uh, delve too deep into all that this morning. But uh, worship really is something that's deeper than that. It's more than just singing. It's more than just praising God with your lips. But the word worship contains the word, the English word worship, contains the word worth, doesn't it? it? Part of the word worth is in the word worship. And that's where the English word worship comes from. It's giving something the worth that it is due. And what type of worth is God due? You know, there's people, they worship they, they, they don't acknowledge that God is worthy of worship, but they uh, worship other things. Some people worship statues, don't they? Or stone gods. And they think that those are worthy of all of their offerings or whatever. Some people, like uh, self-claimed atheists or humanists, they really are worshiping themselves, aren't they? They're worshiping themselves. They are saying, I am worthy of adoration. My mind, you know, uh, they exalt their knowledge above what the Bible says about God. And they're, they're saying, my opinion is worth more than God's opinion. <clears throat> Some people worship angels. They think they're worthy of adoration. But uh, Mr. Pavitt preached a message. I got to listen to it on, on the YouTube channel about uh, worshiping God in the last chapter of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And he was saying that, uh, that the angels said, don't worship me, worship God. Get up, get off your feet. And we're not supposed to worship people or angels, or statues. Only God is worthy of worship. But uh, in the middle of all the worship that there is in the world today, all sorts of things we worship, we're Bible believers. We should be unashamed to proclaim that the only one worthy of worship is God Almighty. That's right. And that's why we're gathered here together today, isn't it? We're gathered to worship the Lord God of he heaven, and Him alone. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. By the way, we're going to be starting a series on Revelation this week uh, in our church. But uh, Revelation 4, 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God created us for His pleasure. He created us to worship Him. And uh, the Bible tells us that the angels in uh, chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 12, they say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And, uh, you know, if you, if you look there at chapter 4 and then you look at chapter 5 of Revelation together, you see that, that God the Father is worthy of worship. In, verse, in chapter 4, verse 11, it's actually talking about God the Father, verses 9, 10, and 11. But, you know, in, in chapter 5, it's talking about God the Son, and He's worthy of worship. And if you look at verse 13, it says that, of chapter 5, it says that they're, they're both worthy of worship together. It says, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such are as in the sea, and all that are in them heard heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, that's the Father, and unto the Lamb, that's the Son, forever and ever. So Jesus is worthy of worship. Now some people don't worship Jesus, uh, but the Bible's very clear that one of the many reasons why we believe Jesus is God is because he received worship many times. You know, we... we uh, try to reason with people. We don't just believe that Jesus is God blindly, but there's many, many reasons why. And, uh, of course, we try to help people here at our church to get the answers. And here in England, you know, I think that we're at the, we're at the day and age where people really, are, they know what's at stake. They know we need to explain to people what, why we believe what we believe. They know people are going to 
mock us for worshiping God only and saying he's the only one worthy of worship. And they're going to say that that's, uh, that's wrong. And so we need to be able to answer those types of people, don't we? And so we need to know why Jesus is worthy of worship. God's worthy of worship, but Jesus is too. And uh, all throughout the Bible, here we see the angels worshiping Jesus. He's worthy. Uh, the people are worthy, uh, are worshiping Jesus. In chapter 22 uh, of Revelation, the, the chapter that Mr. Pavitt preached from a couple weeks ago, in verse 3, it says, uh, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. We're going to be serving Him. We're going to be worshiping Him. We're going to be doing uh, all these things for Him. And you know what? Uh, some people, they don't like the fact that Jesus is worshipped. Uh, but over and over in the book, in the Bible, it's clear that, uh, that He is. In, uh, in Matthew chapter uh, 2, this, let's just look at the book of Matthew. There's many times where Jesus received worship, but just in the book of Matthew, let's look at a few of them there. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. It says, And when they were come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. So we see that the wise men worshipped Jesus. Look at chapter 14 of Matthew. It says in verse 33, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So the disciples worshipped Jesus. Uh, look at chapter, or now look at the last chapter of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And verse 9, it says uh, that these uh, women, it says, And they quickly departed from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and <coughs> worshipped him. And then if you look there at verses 16 and 17 of the same chapter, it says, And the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. That's right before his ascension as well. And there's at least four other examples in the gospel records alone of people worshipping Jesus. Now, if Jesus was a mere man, it would be blasphemy to worship him. You know, when Herod in Acts chapter... Um, in Acts chapter uh, 12, verse 23, King Herod, he accepted where people said, he is a God, and he accepted the worship. He said, oh yeah, I'm a God. And what happened in Acts chapter 12, verse 23? The angel of God sent worms to eat him up, and he died right there in front of the big amphitheater of people. It's a terrible thing to accept worship. In, uh, in the book of Revelation as well, uh, an, uh, John sees an angel, and he's amazing, and he falls down before the angel, and he says, get up! I'm, I'm not God. Worship God only. And of course, in Lystra, people tried to worship Paul, and Paul said, I'm a mere man, not just like you. Uh, worship God. And so, why didn't Jesus say any of those things? You know, why did he accept worship and not get eaten up by worms for doing it? Because he is God. He is worthy of worship. And uh, nowhere in the scripture does anyone in a right relationship with God accept worship, except for it's reserved for God alone. And Jesus even said to the devil, in uh, in Matthew in uh, I'm sorry in Matthew chapter four, uh, I believe it is. He says uh, um, the devil says to worship him, and he said uh, it's only God is worthy of worship, and so uh, Jesus uh, is worthy of our worship, and so that was a kind of a, a side trail. That was a bit of a, a rabbit trail there, but but God is worthy. Uh, now in Hebrew the word worship. There's two uh, Hebrew or Greek words uh, for worship. Two words in the Bible for one's Greek and one's Hebrew. And so the word for worship means to bow down and to pay homage. But one of the Greek words means literally to kiss the ground. To kiss the ground. And the other Greek word means to serve. To serve or to uh, minister. And so when we worship God, we need to do both. We need to uh, not only acknowledge who God is, but we need to 
bow down, worship, have the right attitude, but we also need to have the right action. And that's the two points, that's the main two points of the sermon today. We need to worship God with our attitudes and with our actions. Now, uh, by the way, this is another side note. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe that Jesus is supposed to be worshipped. And so they actually, in their Bible, they have changed. Every time the word worship is used for Jesus, they change it to the word obeisance. They change it. You know, that happened, uh, that's happened uh, uh, in 1971. Before that, they kept all the word worship for Jesus. In 1960, their 1950 Bible and the 1961 Bible, but I read that in 1971 they changed it all because they don't believe Jesus should be worshipped. And so they changed it, but they kept the word worship 30 times in the New Testament when it doesn't refer to Jesus, but uh, 15 times when it does refer to Jesus, they changed it. Now there's a very strong warning not to change the Bible, isn't there, in the book of Revelation. You get cursed for changing the Bible, and yet they've done that. We should not just change the Bible, we should... Do what it says. We should worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We should kiss Him and we should kiss the ground before Him with our attitudes. But we should also serve Him with our actions. And the Bible says that we should worship God in John 4.24. Jesus said to the woman at the well, They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, if you just worship God with your attitude and you never actually worship him with uh, if you just worship him on Sundays you dress up maybe you maybe even put a tie on or you don't have to do that but maybe you even do that but maybe you you don't worship him Monday through Saturday you're not worshiping him in truth you're not worship, you're, you might worship him in spirit but you're not worshiping him if you don't physically live out your worship then it's not true worship you know we have to submit our lives to the truth of God's word with our spirit and with truth we doctrine is very important we should say, I submit to whatever you say in the Bible. And you know, if you have some, some churches, they have lots of spirit but no truth. You know, uh, that's just an ungodly worship. But some people worship God with just truth but with no spirit, with no joyfulness. And that's just empty worship, isn't it? And so we need spirit and truth. You know, uh, some churches uh, in our day, they've redefined worship. They try to work it up in their spirit without any truth. It becomes a, a, a worldly thing. Uh, but pe there's some people who have no real power because it's not according to God's word. It's only a form of, of godliness. And so what we want is true worship that pleases God. So the point number one is we should acknowledge God. We should acknowledge that he's worthy of worship. Look here at chapter 95 of Psalms again right there in the middle of your Bible where we started. And look at verse number 3. It says, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. First thing we should do is we should acknowledge that He is worthy of worship. And there are several things we should acknowledge about His, his greatness, His power, His, his worthiness. And look at verses 4 and 5. The first thing is we should acknowledge that He's worthy of our worship because He is our Creator. Verse 4, it says, In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands form the dry land. You know, when we come to God, we should acknowledge that he is our creator. He's our creator. We wouldn't be here without him. We wouldn't exist. He created us. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiworks. You know, I've never seen such clear skies in all, in all my life than I did on top of the Rocky Mountains this past uh, couple weeks. And, uh, you know, uh, no lights around, and you could, see the, the, you could see the Big Dipper so clearly. But the Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. Why did God create so many stars? You know, why did He do it? Well, the Bible says that in, in just one verse, and He created the stars also. <laughs> and yet they're so... Huge, they just keep going and going. Well, if, if all the stars weren't there, then the gravity of the whole universe would be off just a little bit, and the earth wouldn't be the just it might be if there was one star missing, maybe the earth would the gravity of the universe would be so that the earth was one foot closer to the sun and we'd all uh, burn up, or maybe one foot away from the sun and we'd all freeze to death, you know. But he made it just right. He's that and also he made all the stars just to remind us how huge he is and how powerful he is, and to help us to realize that the firmament showeth his handiwork. 
uh, the, the heavens declare. You know, if you're an evolutionist and you think that uh, the world just came from nothing, you can't worship God. You can't approach God. We have to approach God and say, you are our creator. Uh, he's the very reason for our existence and for our senses. Look at verse number 6 again. It says, O come, approach again. O, o come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. He's our, he's our maker. He's our creator. The second thing, we should worship. When we acknowledge God, we should worthy, realize that He is worthy of our worship because He is our Savior. He's our Savior. Not only our creator. Now here in England, we... We, we need to tell people that they need to be saved, but before that, we have, we have to sometimes start with the fact that it, there is a God. God created you. But then once, we, once they realize that there is a God, we can say, God, you're accountable to Him. You've sinned against Him. You've broken God's law. Heaven's perfect. God's perfect. We're not perfect. We need Him to be our Savior. And so uh, Jesus Christ is our Savior. Look at verse number 1 of Psalm 95. It says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. He's the rock of our salvation. Now, uh, that rock means it's a firm basis. You know, it gives us certainty of salvation. We can come to God and we can have certainty that we are going to heaven. Do you know 100% for sure today that you're going to heaven? Well, you can, though. The Lord Jesus Christ told us, that, uh, that he was going to die in our place. And he is the rock of our salvation. He's, he's, he, he says, if you hear the sayings of mine and do them, you're building your house on the rock. And what did Jesus say? He said to believe on him and you would, you would find salvation. You know that word rock of our salvation is found four times in the Old Testament uh, when Moses was uh, uh, singing. When he, Moses' song in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses sang about God being the rock of our sin. So when you come to God and worship Him, you should re remember He's your Savior. Moses said in Deuteronomy 32 verse 15 that Israel had waxed fat. They had gotten thick. They got covered with fatness. In other words, they got complacent. They forgot that God was the rock of their salvation. It says they forsook God which made Him and lightly esteemed the rock of their salvation. If you lightly esteem your salvation, you can't approach God. But when you approach God and worship Him, Worship Him for not only creating you, but for saving you. When David sang, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, it says that after David had gotten, he had finished all his fighting in the wars against his enemies, he sang about God being his salvation. He says, He only is my salvation. In uh, 2 Samuel 22, and he repeats that in Psalm 18. And then Isaiah chapter 17, he Isaiah also sings about God being the rock of their salvation. Isaiah 17, verse 10, he says, Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. We need to not, not forget. We need to be mindful of God's salvation. And then, you know what? Jesus Christ, he is the Lamb of God. When, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He is the Savior. You know, uh, to, when we look at the book of Revelation, we're going to see that, that the word Lamb of God, or the, or the Lamb, is mentioned 28 times in the book of Revelation. He is the beginning, of, and He's the ending. He is the rock that we can, uh, we can bank our whole eternity on Him. And it's a solid foundation. And then, not only that, but look at verse number 3. Not only He's our Creator and our Redeemer, but look at verse number 3 of Psalm 95. He says, we can worship God because He is our King. Verse number three, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. We should acknowledge that he's worthy because he is the king. And one day, Revelation 11, 5, 15 says that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. He is the king, so we should worship him. So when we bow our knees to him, we're acknowledging that he's our creator, our our sustainer, our redeemer, our savior, and he's the king of kings, and he's the lord of lords. So we should acknowledge him. Then we should have the right attitude when we approach him. Look at verse 1 again. This is the second point. We should have the right attitude. It says in verse 1, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise 
to the rock of our salvation. So when you come, by the way, this, this chapter says three times, come. You, know, you might think, I'm not worthy to come before God, but three times in verse 1, in verse 2, in verse 6, you see that little word, come. And again, it means approach. That, mean, that word approach means meet with Him. You can have a meeting with Him. But when you come, you should have the right attitude. You know, if you uh, were going to approach the queen, hopefully you'd have the right attitude or you'd probably get kicked out. In the old days, you might have lost your head, but, uh, but w when you approach God, you should also have the right attitude. He says here, sing. Make a, let us make a joyful noise. Those are words that are express the highest kind of joy. So when we worship God, we should have an attitude of joyfulness. An attitude of joyfulness. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong when you're worshiping God to smile, Amen. to uh, be glad about the things of God. You should be glad about the things of God. You know, there's so many, there's, there's, there's more than enough dead traditional, traditionalism, ortho, uh, dead orthodoxy in churches. And, uh, you know, when we gather as a church, we should be happy, shouldn't we? Worshiping God. When, we, when you go into your quiet time and open your Bible and want to pray, you should be happy. That should be the happiest moment of your day. And, uh, you know, it's a joy that the world doesn't know anything about. But we do. And, uh, you know, when we thank Him, when we enter His presence, we thank Him about all of His blessings in our life, we should be joyful. Also, in verse 2, it says, Let us come before Him, before His presence, with what? Thanksgiving. That's right. You know, we have to understand that biblical worship revolves around this idea of thanking God for all that He's done. You know, you, well, I don't know what you're, what, how you're feeling today, or how tired you are today, or how, much a, how terrible you feel today. There's something you could be thankful for. You know, God's blessed you. You can be thankful. And then uh, third thing, look at verse number 6. We, we, our attitude towards God shouldn't just be joyful and thankful, but it also, look at verse 6, it also should be reverent. Look at verse 6. It says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before God, our Maker. Now you might say, Pastor Jonathan, reverent, that's kind of the opposite of joyful, but it's not really the opposite, it's just complementary to it. You know, uh, some, some people, they might have thankful and joyful worship, but if it's not reverent worship, they've missed the mark for, for worshiping God. You know, God is holy, isn't He? God is... Uh, he, the Bible says we're supposed to bow down before Him. You know, if, if, if you were, if there's some worship that is way too irreverent. Uh, now, I, I told you I wasn't going to get too much into uh, the music, but, uh, but there is a lot of commercialization of Christianity today, isn't there? And there's a lot of what, what we call, what people call Christian rock or Christian rap. Uh, that type of thing, and really those two words are opposites, <laughs> you know, Christian and rap. But well, why do I say that? Because, uh, well, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, they were saying, when, 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 G when Isaiah saw God sitting upon his throne, what was happening there? He fell upon his face, because he saw the angels surrounding the throne saying, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we truly see God for who he is, we'll be reverent. There's that, I wasn't really going to talk about this this morning, but those, those, God always does things in threes, doesn't he? Holy, holy, holy. And, uh, you know, we're body, soul, and spirit, aren't we? Uh, God is a trinity. We have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Our body is, uh, the, is the outside. Uh, but what's the most important thing of body, soul, and spirit? Your spirit is the most important. And uh, then your soul, your emotions should, should follow the spiritual things. And then your, your, your body, your flesh, they should, you should try to get that to, to follow your spirit as well. But music, it has three parts too, doesn't it? It has melody, harmony, and rhythm. And the, mu the, the words have a message, but the music also has a message. You know, we were, in a, we were traveling in, in Colorado, and 
we we found a, we went to church every time we we could while we were traveling, and every Sunday and every Wednesday we were in church. But one time we found a church, and and we, the the preaching was great, the the words to the music were really great, but the music that went along with that music made me sick, actually physically sick, and I was trying to figure out why. Why I felt like that is because I couldn't hardly hear the words to the music because uh, they had s drums that were so loud uh, that I couldn't really even think about the words. Now, drums maybe aren't uh, evil in and of themselves, but when, that, when, when it's trying to work up and people into a frenzy and work up the flesh, then uh, the music, the, the message of the music and the message of the words, they really clashed in my heart and I couldn't really focus on worshiping God. Now, you might say, oh, preacher, you're meddling now. And maybe, I, maybe, you don't have, maybe you don't agree with me about that, but that was just a little extra. That was a freebie. No extra charge for that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we should be reverent. Now, A.W. Tozer, he said that no one can know the true grace of God until he has known the fear of God mm -hmm. as well. And that's what Isaiah was like. He said, woe is me, for I am undone. When we really take the Bible, which is like a mirror, and we hold it up to us, and we say we, we see who we really are, then hopefully we'll realize that, just like Isaiah did, I'm unclean. Uh, when we see God for who He is, we should bow before Him and say, Help me. Clean me. Make me more like you. A.W. Tozer, he, was, uh, he wrote a book called The Pursuit of God and Knowledge of the Holy, and he wrote a lot of book about prayer and about approaching God. But he said, you have to have the fear of God if you're ever going to really appreciate the grace of God. And you know what? When he was a teenager, he experienced the, the, the fear of God. A.W. Tozer, he was uh, walking home in Ohio from a, a tire, his, his job at a tire company, and uh, he heard a street preacher. And the street preacher, he just overheard the street preacher, and the street preacher said, uh, if you don't know how to be saved from hell, just call on God saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so all the way home, A.W. Tozer was thinking about the, what that preacher said, and when he got home, he went up into the attic, and he heeded the preacher's advice. He, he called upon the Lord and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he used to say, that street preacher probably never knew that I did that, but uh, I'm so thankful that he did, and he put the fear of God in me. You know, We need the fear of God before we can appreciate His grace. And remember what Jesus said, he said, when we're praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's reverence, recognizing his holiness when we enter. And so many, uh, so many people in this world, so many churches in this world, they try to bring God down to our level when they're worshiping him. And they try to match him with the world, with the fleshly world. But that's not how we're supposed to be. Jesus said, be ye holy, for I am holy. And we need a respect for God in our hearts and in our church services. And then, uh, so we've talked about acknowledging God. We've talked about our attitude when we come to God in worship. And now, what about our action in worship? Not just an attitude, but it's action as well. It doesn't matter if you listen to all the right kind of music. It doesn't matter if you do all the right thing. You know, it, like I said, it's nothing to do with salvation what music you listen to. Otherwise, it would be legalism. But uh, it is important, and so. Uh, but what? That, that, that's not as important as the action behind our worship. Now, I, remember, I said the second word for worship. The first one was to kiss the ground, and the second one is to serve. Those are the two words for worship in the in the original languages, and the second one means to serve. Look at ver and here in Psalm ninety-five, uh, the rest of the chapter, from six verse six onwards. It, uh, it talks about that. We, yes, we need to approach with the right attitude of acknowledging His greatness, but the rest of the psalm warns us against neglecting the action of serving Him. Verse 6 and 7, it says, O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the sheep of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. 
So he says, these people, they worship me with their lips, but in their heart they didn't. And so they had to wander around for 40 years in the wilderness. They didn't, they didn't get where they were going for 40 years. And, uh, you know, you might put on, uh, you might carry a Bible even to church, put on nice clothes, go through all the motions every week without having a heart of service. But worship's more than just having the right attitude. Remember uh, Judas Iscariot, you know, he... Uh, he was worshiping God with his lips. He, he went to Jesus in the Garden of Eden, and he kissed him. Remember, that's what the first word for worship means, to kiss. And he was doing all the show, but he wasn't really worshiping God, was he? he uh, it, was, it was mockery. It was blasphemy. And so many people, they come to church, they pretend to worship God, but they don't do it throughout the week. There's no action behind it, and so that's mockery too, isn't it? So, uh, but true worship will involve all of you, your whole life. We just read in verse 7, He is our God. We are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. He's supposed to lead us all in all of our life. He's our shepherd. We're the sheep. The way that you live throughout the week, we should allow Him to be our shepherd. It involves our whole life. Uh, now, there's a verse in the Bible that says, that talks about our reasonable service. You know, we're not supposed to worship God with our hearts, but with our service. What is our reasonable service? Well, the Bible says in Romans 12, verse 1, it talks about that. And he says that uh, you're, you're believer priests, you know. Uh, you don't have to go to Old Testament priests anymore to get to God. You don't have to sacrifice anymore to get to God. Jesus has already sacrificed it on the cross. He was the ultimate sacrifice. But he says, now, when you come to God... The sacrifice that you have to give is not a sheep or a goat or a lamb, but it's yourself. Romans 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you by the uh, mercies of God that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know, uh, if, if you're going to rightly worship God, you have to present your whole body. You know, you can't just uh, say, okay, God, here's a little bit of me. And then crawl off the altar again. You don't need to stay on the altar and allow him to have all of you. And the Bible says that's reasonable. You know, uh, worship is not just from 10.30 a.m. to 12 o'clock. It's not just from 6 to 7.30 at night on Sunday night. It's not just from 7 to 8.30 on Wednesday night. But it is 24-7, isn't it? And it involves a change when we say, take my life, it's yours. If you want to use my hands to help somebody this week, I'll worship you with my hands. If you want to use my, uh, my lips to talk about somebody about you, I'll, I'll surrender my lips to you. If you want to use my feet to go and tell somebody about you, I'll surrender my feet. I'll go and, go and talk to them about you. My entire self. You know, if, if, a, if a pastor asks you to attend church, that's not being unreasonable. That's... Just your reasonable service, isn't it? If the pastor asks you to love the Lord and to tell other people about Jesus, that's not unreasonable. To go and tell people about Jesus and to witness to people, that's just your reasonable service. If the pastor says to you, why don't you give to the work of God, that's not unreasonable. The pastor's not saying something unreasonable. That's just reasonable service. We're supposed to give him our whole self. And uh, that's a very important part of real Spiritual worship. Now we live in a day of lukewarm Christianity, and so that type of that type of whole self Christianity that might look strange to some people, because we live in a day of lukewarm Christians. But the Bible says it's re, it's just reasonable. So the Bible will involve. I mean, true worship will involve everything in your life, but true worship will also transform your life. Look at verse two of Romans twelve. It says, "Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind." And that word transform there in the Greek, it's the word that we get our English word metamorphosis from. You know, what, what do you think of when you think of metamorphosis? Think of little butterflies, you know? And you think of the little cocoon that you maybe, you know, there's some great YouTube videos about the time lapse of, of, a, of a caterpillar turning into a, a beautiful butterfly. And uh, you can look at those things, but you know what? If you're worshiping God, the Bible says you'll be transformed, just like that little caterpillar, you'll become different. You'll be changed. You'll become like a, a beautiful butterfly. And the Bible says God doesn't want just your heart. He wants to transform you. And it says, be not conformed to this world. That little phrase, it's so 
accurately describes Christians of today, doesn't it? They're conforming to the world. They're not being transformed by the renewing of their mind. It's so hard to change. Uh, it's hard for anybody to change, but the Bible says God changes you from the inside out. The renewing of your mind, He can do it. It's a miracle that involves your heart. And uh, if, if worship doesn't change you, it's not been real worship. You know, when we come to God, we worship God by singing. But the singing is just getting you ready for the real worship, which is after you hear the preaching of God's word, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be any different when you leave those double doors? Are you going to be any different uh, in your heart? That's, the real, that's where the real worship comes into play. And the singing is helpful to get our hearts ready for all that to listen to the Word of God, but it involves action. But then finally, here in Psalm 95, there are some enemies of worship, and one of those enemies is our own heart. Our own heart. It says in verse 8, Harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation, and in the day of temptation of the Lord. That's Hebrews 3, verse 7. And he, he quotes that same verse Paul does later in Hebrews chapter 3. But he says, Today, if you'll hear his words, Harden not your heart. You know, your, your, your own heart can be an enemy. You know there's three enemies in the Bible? There's the world, there's the flesh, and there's the devil. But the biggest enemy, according to this uh, verse, as far as when it comes to worship, is your own flesh, your own heart. It's so easy for people to harden their hearts. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Israelites in Numbers 14, he's using God's language here in Psalm 95. He's, God said that they had hardened their hearts. They had provoked the Lord because they started murmuring against God and they never got to the promised land when they were supposed to. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14, He that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Proverbs 28, verse 14, He that hardeneth his heart will fall into mischief. You know the Israelites, they did that. They hardened their heart in the wilderness. They pretty soon they fell into mischief, didn't they? They started worshiping God. Well, they started worshiping other gods, didn't they? They started worshiping a golden calf, and they fell into mischief. They started worshiping in a worldly way, didn't they? They started dancing around the, the, uh, the golden calf and getting all worked up into a frenzy. And, and, uh, and they had all this noise. It's like the noise of war, uh, Moses said, as he was coming down off the mountain. And they were worshiping God in totally the wrong way. And that happens to us, too. If we harden our hearts for God, we will fall into mischief. We'll start worshiping other things, and we'll start worshiping... In, bad, in, in wrong ways. Now, pe since people's hearts are so hard nowadays, churches think that they really have to work up the worship into a big frenzy and they have to try to get everybody worked up, but really what we need to do, we just need to ask the Lord to soften our hearts and to help us. And so when we come to church, it's, it's, it's something between you and God. God can, God can soften people's hearts. People are you can pray for people. You can pray for your own heart. That God will soften it. And the Word of God can work on it. But you know what? The world is trying to get you to worship God in a worldly way. Your own heart is getting hard, your flesh, but then there's the devil as well. You know, he wants to be worshipped, doesn't he? The devil is the third enemy of worship. And, uh, you know, there's millions of people who are bowing down, not to God, but they're bowing down to Satan. There's people who, who use Ouija boards. There's people who start... Uh, using pentagrams and all the satanic rituals and the mysticisms and the Eastern religions and all those things. And there's some people who just totally give themselves over to worshiping Satan. But you know what? Satan, it shouldn't surprise us, Satan has always wanted people to worship him. He has wanted to sit on God's throne. And in Matthew 4, verse 9, he says, all, he said, Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Satan... <laughs> If Satan was tempting Jesus to worship him, he's going to tempt us to worship him. Maybe, maybe not directly, but in subtle other ways, perhaps. But in Matthew 4, verse 10, Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou worship. Shall thou serve by me. You should worship him, and you should serve him. Jesus said, he's, He alone is worthy of worship. You can't serve or worship two masters. You can only serve one. Which one are you serving this, uh, this morning? Let's pray together. Father, as we bow in prayer, we know that uh, we should acknowledge you as our creator, as our savior, 
as our sustainer, Father, and as our as our um, uh, our everything, Father. We pray that you'll that you'll take our lives, help us to lay ourselves before you, and involve our entire heart, our entire self, and help us to be transformed and changed into your image. Help us to not only uh, come to you in with a with the right attitude, but help us to come to you with the right actions as well. I pray that each person in this room will examine their own heart that may be hardened. I pray that you'll ask them to, that they will ask you to soften their heart. Help me to have a softened heart towards you, Father. Help me to know and, and come to you with a humble heart, confessing my own sins. And Father, I pray that each, each one in this room will do the same. Father, may we leave this place different than how we came. And uh, may we each take action in our own hearts as we finish the sermon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you need to be saved today, if you need to acknowledge the Lord as your Savior or as your King, please do that today. You can ask questions if you don't have that right.